today. Windows, and it really certainly has a way of lifting our spirits. So whether you are here in person or whether you are joining through Zoom, you are welcome. As the candle is being lit today, hear these words from Psalms 27. The Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? Psalms 100, verse 5. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let us join together in reading the great thanksgiving and offer our Thanks and praise to God. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. When we cried to you, you heard us and set us free. You divided the sea and let us pass through. You led us with a cloud and a fiery light. You made streams come out of a rock and caused waters to flow. We praise you saying, holy, 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 God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Amen. Good morning to everyone. Uh, we'll sing our, um, our songs today out of Voices Together again. That's the blue hymnal, and they're listed in your, your purple, sorry, purple <laughs> hymnal. Too many choices. So I guess it's good that we list them in the, in the bolt, and we didn't used to do that until we started going online, did we? 57. 57, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Holy Spirit, come with power, breathe into our aching night. We expect you this glad hour, waiting for your strength and light. We are fearful and willing, we are look and selfish too. Wait upon your congregation, give us vigor and life on you. Would you like to stand? I was going to have you stand on this one. We'll stand for the last two verses. Holy Spirit, come with fire, burn us with your presence new. Let us as one mighty choir sing our hymn of praise to you. Burn away our hearts of sadness and inform us with your love. Burst upon your congregation, give us gladness from above. Holy 
Spirit, bring your message, burn and breathe each word anew, deep into our time living, till we strive your work to do. Teach us love and trust in kindness, and our hands to those who hurt. Breathe upon your congregation, and inspire us with your word. You may be seated. <clears throat> Number 311. 311. Larry, you'll have to tell us whether this was any, in any of the old hymnals. We are often tossed and driven on the restless sea of time. Somber skies and howling tempest thoughts succeed the bright sunshine. In the land of perfect day, when the mists have rolled away, we will understand it better by and by. Shelter, thirsty hills and barren lands. We are trusting in the Lord, and according to the word, we will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes, when the saints of God are gathered home, we will tell the story. Temptations, hidden snares often take the sun unawares, and our hearts we need to bleed for every thought is word or deed, and we wonder why the test when we try to do our best, we will understand it better by and by. By and by, when the morning comes. And number 365. Lord, I lift your name on high. Lord, I love to sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. So glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My debt to pay from the cross to the grave, from the grave to the sky. For I lift your name on. sing your praises. I'm so glad you're in my life. I'm so glad you came to save us. You came from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross. My death to pay from the cross from the grave to the sky, for I lift your name on high. 
How good it is to hear God's people sing his praises. Thank you, Marla and Sam and Mary Lee and Dennis for helping prepare our hearts um, to hear what the Lord has to say to us today. Today's message is from the book of Joshua at a time when the Israelites are taking the final step of their wilderness journey into the land that God had promised them. Crossing the Jordan River is a key event in Israel's history. As we encounter this story, this miraculous display of God's power and glory, may we be assured that what God has done in the past, God is doing in the here and now, and will continue to do in the future. Our God is faithful. Please turn in your Bibles to Joshua 4, 18 through 24, or follow what's on PowerPoint. And the priests came up out of the river carrying the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. No sooner had they set their feet on the dry ground than the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and ran at flood stage as before. On the 10th day of the first month, the people went up from the Jordan and camped at Gilgal on the eastern border of Jericho. And Joshua set up at Gilgal the 12 stones they had taken out of the Jordan. He said to the Israelites, in the future, when your descendants ask their fathers, what do these stones mean? Tell them, Israel crossed the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the Jordan before you until you had crossed over. The Lord your God did to the Jordan just what he had done to the Red Sea when he dried it up before us until we had crossed over. He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Jessica. Lord, we commit ourselves to listen, to remember, and to consecrate ourselves in obedience to you as you lead us and as we seek to make meaning together of who you are and what you are calling us to be. Be with Jessica as she speaks your words, as she speaks the message that you have given her to share with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we have a particular fondness in our family for finding statues. This isn't something we put a lot of energy into, but it is noticed, especially by the youngest member of our family, when we drive around and see a new statue. In fact, even mannequins in the store are often pointed out as statues. <laughs> um, but this was sparked mostly after we found a rather unique statue in Tremont, just off of North Sampson Street, outside of one of the baseball fields. In the summer, if you make a stop for some ice cream, um, then take a short walk down Samson Street, you'll run across this simple statue of a barefoot boy with a squirrel on his shoulder. This unexpected um, and sweet little find was a nice surprise hidden among some plants, grasses, and flowers. I'm not exactly sure what the meaning is behind this statue. The little bit of history that I did find um, just tells about the artist a little bit, Viola Norman. She grew up in a house at the corner of Samson and Taswell Streets in Tremont, and she had a talent for art. She sculpted this for Nettie Washburn, a neighbor and mentor, um, who eventually donated it to the town of Tremont. And the 106-year-old statue was dedicated in a ceremony on November 7, November 7th, 1915. I'm sure we've been asked before by one of the boys why this statue is there. I've wondered so myself. It's kind of a curious little discovery when you find it. Um, after all, most statues or memorials have a story behind them. Whether we know the reason or not, there is something that has been commemorated or remembered. It's typically an honorary public symbol for a person or an event. As humans, we have formed communities and relationships with each other, which means that there are things that we experience separately 
while there are also things that we experience together. And when we go through something together, especially something monumental, well, we have adopted a practice of remembering it with a monument. This is similar to what we see in the scripture um, that was read for today. But before I get too much into um, the message, I do want to clarify that we're not going along with the adult Sunday school material anymore. We finished that series, and so this week and next week, we have just kind of some standalone messages before we start the season of Advent. But I was inspired for this week's message by a resource that I signed up to receive from Menno Media called What Now? Leading Churches Through COVID. For the months of August, September, and October, they released a toolkit with various resources to nurture community and support the mission and ministry of churches in this unique time. So the message title, Making Meaning Together, was an intergenerational worship event that they offered in October's toolkit. The ideas they presented, along with the example from scripture, really intrigued me. And I think this follows along nicely with the series that we just spent um, the last month thinking about, the church as assembly. As a community of faith, we experience things together, life, loss, growth, disappointment, disagreements, joy, worship, lament, and much more. And we, as well as the whole world, have been through a life-changing experience over the last 20 months since the global pandemic began. I don't know anybody who hasn't asked themselves some questions during this time, questions ranging from seemingly simple to very deep questions. And as a community, when gathered based on our shared faith and biblical worldview, it makes sense that we would make meaning of this experience together. Unique to us as a gathered body of Christian believers, as opposed to just a social club, we find the Holy Spirit in community. When we experience something together, we can identify God's faithfulness through the experience and grow our faith for those of us present now, as well as those who are yet to come in the future. The Israelites, a community of God's people, were on a journey, a journey that lasted years. For 40 years, since Moses led the Israelites out of the slavery of Egypt, they had been waiting for the promised land. It's been 40 years since their lives were drastically changed. Imagine with me how they felt throughout that experience. At times, I think they felt a range of emotions, maybe fear, relief, thrill, excitement, despair, discouragement, exhaustion, confusion, hopelessness, and even hopefulness. For 40 years, they journeyed together in a foreign land where it became clear how necessary it was that they trust God. I'm not the first one to make this comparison, but how is this pandemic a wilderness journey for us today? We were all plunged into this experience together and with the whole world, and for many of us, our lives were drastically changed, especially at the beginning. We had no clue what to expect when it began or how long it would last. And like the Israelites, I think we have and continue to feel a range of emotions. We might have fear of getting sick. At the beginning, maybe we felt relief from hectic schedules, or we were thrilled to be at home for a few weeks and relax in comfortable clothes. Maybe there's excitement thinking about how things might change when this is all over, or feelings of despair at the effects that it has had on our relationships. I think there's also feelings of discouragement when the end didn't come as we expected, or just exhaustion from the whole thing. Confusion about what choices are right. Hopelessness, wondering, is this going to end? And also hopefulness that this experience might just grow and deepen our faith. Those are all the same emotions that I imagine the Israelites felt, and possibly for many of the same reasons. 
But now with the scripture um, and the larger part of the story that we are looking at today, the Israelites are nearing the end of their wandering. They're gonna be entering the promised land. This is an exciting part of their journey and it is worth processing what has happened thus far and also remembering this moment. Um, I wanna share with you a version of Joshua three to four. Um, and just instead of reading the whole thing, I'm gonna share it as if maybe it was being presented on the news. So you can imagine a reporter saying, as she's standing there at the Jordan River, this morning, a group calling themselves the Israelites crossed the Jordan River on dry ground. The waters are still parted and a group is standing in the middle holding a large box they call an ark. Who are these people and what are they doing here? That's what we're here to find out. And she approaches an Israelite and says, excuse me, but can you tell me what happened this morning? The Israelite responds, well, after 40 years wandering through the desert, our group finally arrived at the banks of the Jordan and set up camp. Three days passed, then officers went through our camp and said, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the priest, follow it so that you may know the way you should go, for you have not passed this way before. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, a distance of about 2,000 cubits. Do not come any nearer to it. So Joshua then told us to get ready because tomorrow God is going to do wonders among us. And of course, the reporter is going to move on to Joshua um, and say, what, uh, what led you to say that God will do wonders? Well, Joshua responds, God spoke to me. So I called the Israelites together and told them what God had said. God said to me, all Israel will know that I will be with you as I was with Moses. Tell the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand in the Jordan. And so that's what I did. I told the people that by this you shall know that among you is the living God. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth is going to pass before you into the Jordan. When the soles of the feet of the priests who bear the Ark touch the waters of the Jordan, the waters will stand still. I can imagine the reporter in some disbelief. And she says, let's talk to one of the priests carrying the ark, the, the sign of God's presence. Sir, what did you do when you heard Joshua say these things? The priest says, well, the Jordan normally overflows all its banks of this time of year, but we priests did as Joshua commanded anyway. And when our feet touched the edge of the river, the water stood still, leaving us on dry ground. We stood in the middle of the river until all the people crossed to the other side. And as the reporter listens to this, she sees some commotion and she goes to listen in on Joshua, who says, listen, God has said, select 12 men, one from each tribe and command them to take 12 stones out of the middle of the Jordan. Carry these stones with you and lay them down in the place where you camp tonight. Each of you 12 who have been chosen must pass through, pass before the ark of the Lord and take up a stone on your shoulder, one for each of the tribes of Israel. Build a memorial with these stones to help you remember what happened today. So then the reporter goes on to explain what she sees happening. The 12 men are gathering the stones. Meanwhile, Joshua is setting up 12 stones in the river where the feet of the priests are. Those rocks will probably stay in the riverbed forever, she says. Now the priests are moving out of the middle of the Jordan and crossing in front of the people to once again lead the way. There must be 40,000 people moving toward Jericho. The waters of the Jordan are returning and the Israelites plan to set up camp east of Jericho at Gilgal. That's quite the story. And this is the larger story that we're talking about today. It really does not disappoint with excitement. There's some significant stuff happening between God and Joshua. God performs a miraculous event and the Israelites create this memorial. Now this is way more than we can um, really appreciate and focus this morning. Uh, but I do just wanna point out a few things quick about the first two sections of the story. First in Joshua 3, seven through eight, God acknowledges Joshua's leadership in a special way. 
And he says that Israel will see Joshua as they did Moses, someone accompanied by God. This isn't just like a little sidetrack that got thrown in the story. Rather, it adds an extra emphasis to God's presence with Joshua and with the people. And the second part that I just want to briefly talk about is the significance of crossing the Jordan River. It is pretty crazy what happened. I mean, it's not, you know, the people, it says that in chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, the Jordan is at flood stage. Yet as soon as the priest who carried the ark reached the water and their feet touch it, the water stopped flowing. It piled up in a heap a great distance away um, so that the people could completely cross over. And the priests who were carrying the ark stood on dry ground the whole time. It's not like we haven't seen God do amazing things with water before. Like when the Israelites uh, crossed the Red Sea as they left Egypt and Pharaoh's army tried to follow them. But yet this is still amazing. A river that's at flood stage is not just like crossing a tiny creek. And yet the priest's feet touched the water and the water stops flowing. The whole nation of Israel passed by on dry ground. I think it's important to draw out the details of this event because this is incredible. As they near the end of the event, it says in verses four or chapter four, verses 10 through 11, um, that the priests who bore the ark remained standing in the middle of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded Joshua. There's some significance in there because it says until everything was finished that the Lord commanded. This makes it clear that the safe crossing that takes place is not just, God, not just Joshua's own initiative, but it's truly through God's power that this happened. And this is why the Israelites build a memorial. This part of the story is our main focus for this morning. Because as I've already mentioned, when a community experiences something significant together, it needs to be recognized and marked in some way. There are three ways that I think we need to look at this portion of the story. First, the community follows God. Second, together God's faithfulness is remembered. And third, this becomes part of the community's identity. First, it is because the community follows God throughout the entire journey that they reach this point in the story. Through chapters three and four, it is mentioned that the community depends on God's leading. Like in uh, chapter three, verses three and four, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. And uh, chapter three, verse nine, Joshua said to the Israelites, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. These are familiar practices that as Christians, we still use to guide us today. We seek out the leading of the Holy Spirit and we read scripture in community. We read scripture in Bible studies, worship and discussion times like in Sunday school. It's how we make sense of, of things that happen to us individually and as a group. Something that I think the Israelites did as well. After all, can you imagine not talking with each other uh, about crossing that dry ground where a river was just flowing. That's not something you just do and then move on from. It makes me think of our natural tendencies as humans when there's a big storm, for example. If the storm happens one night when we are all at our own homes, we talk about it the following day with other people who experienced it at their homes, try to find out what their experience was like. We process it together. And that's how we also behave as a Christian community. We read scripture together. We listen for the Holy Spirit and we talk with each other about what is happening in our lives. It all works together. Our faith is not separate from our Monday through Saturday lives. God works in and through it all. Which is also why communities remember God's faithfulness together. In my experience, it is often when time has passed, 
or when I am talking and processing with others that I notice God's hand in my life. Gordon Maddies, who wrote a commentary about Joshua, reflected on this, saying crossing Jordan has always been about more than a physical transition from one land to another. The story represents a threshold, a liminal moment for Israel between promise and fulfillment, between wilderness and fruitfulness, between homelessness and landedness. This was a pivotal moment for them to reflect. Some people in their community had died in the time since they had left Egypt and had been wandering in the wilderness. Others were born in this time span. They had many stories from their time spent wandering to reflect on and see God's faithfulness before they began this new chapter of their story. And here they just experienced another great example of God's faithfulness. I'm sure you've done this before as you talk with people and say that little phrase which can open up a whole story. I remember when dot, dot, dot. And in a little while, we're gonna take some time to reflect on questions that will help us think about and recall God's faithfulness together, especially over the last um, almost two years. In doing this, remembering and naming God's faithfulness, we add to our identity. This is what the Israelites did as the memorial was built with the 12 stones representing each of the 12 tribes. And it specifically says in scripture that the purpose is for when your kids ask, what do these stones mean? So that you can tell them it is where God dried up the Jordan River for us to cross, just as he did the Red Sea. You're building that identity with your kids. Sarah Winger Schenk, um, along with a quote from Walter Brueggemann, writes that this story and a few other Old Testament stories anticipate a time to come when there will be learning readiness and the children will ask the questions of their parents and community. What does it mean to be Israel? Why do we live the way we live and do what we do? The answers will tell the children of the story of their community of its devotion to God and of God's laws, which gives it a distinct identity. These remembered and talked about stories tell our history, but they also give insight to our future, maybe even hope for the future. An Episcopal priest um, reflected on this story with thoughts, with the following thoughts as he compared the acts of crossing the Red Sea with crossing the Jordan River. He wrote, as the Red Sea washed away the identity of Israel, as the Red Sea washed away the identity of Israel as a nation of slaves, Jordan's waters washes away their identity as homeless wanderers. Crossing the Red Sea, God was shown as a God who liberates. Crossing Jordan, God is shown as a God who provides and provides richly. Both of those aspects are so important to the character of God. Forged out of their experience in the wilderness, the Israelites receive a new beginning, a new crossing, a new mighty act of God where the chaos of the waters are harnessed. So the question is, what does our past, our experiences of God's faithfulness say about our future? What new identity, new idea, or new revelation may come as we process the stories and experiences we have to tell? Unfortunately, this isn't one of those messages with a neat and tidy ending. We are on a journey and we need to make meaning of our experiences together. We are a community led by God with memories of God's faithfulness and an identity. But what new memories of God's faithfulness do we still need to process as we continue to share who we are with those around us, the children that are coming up, and the communities where we live and work? There are a few questions, Nathan, if you could go ahead and put those on the screen, um, that might guide our processing and remembering. When or where have you seen God at work during the pandemic? What have you learned during this time? about yourself, about God, about your church? What would you want to tell your children or grandchildren about this time? So we're gonna give you a few minutes to to read these questions and take some time to respond to one of them, if you wouldn't mind. 
you can write an answer on one of the questions that's in the bench or on the paper that's in the bench. And you don't need to write your name because if you don't mind, we'd like to share them um, in just a little while. There's gonna be a song playing so that you have some time to think about it. And then when the song is over, if one person from each bench could bring up the papers and put them in the basket on the table, um, and then the responses will be shared uh, when that is all complete. And when we end this time together, um, there's gonna be a blessing that Marge is going to lead us in together on the screen.
we could collect those responses and One of the things that I heard Jessica say today is um, she's directed our attention to all the significant stuff that is happening, both in the story of Joshua for the Israelites and for us in our time and in this place. And we need to make sense of that. So thank you for your responses. I will read them. and share um, with you and get the sense of the congregation together. Um, being who God created us to be. I've learned a love and tolerance for the wide range of opinions about the pandemic from others and their response to it. God cares for us all. The church has been helpful in meeting needs, spiritual and financial for those in need. The pandemic has affected the whole world. It has challenged Christians everywhere to respond with the love of Christ, both to the devastation of COVID-19 and the destructive forces that were released in reaction to it. I have learned that our church can be adaptable as they work to bring us worship service virtually. It was good to worship with some who live far away. It was good to be able to sing virtually with a choir. I learned that God is faithful through all times. This time challenged me to examine what I really believe as I faced worshiping alone. What have I learned during this time? That I am not in control of the situation. I have to trust God to lead the way, extend grace to others and myself as I navigate during this difficult, and difficult time and remember what is truly important. God is always with me and you and he's working. I have learned that God is faithful he continues to love us and provide for us, even though we don't or didn't meet regularly as we did before. I am a stronger person, even though my, my regular practices have changed. My church is still faithful, even though not fully meeting as in the past. This church still prays, cares, and loves. Some neighbors who needed godly fellowship and, and started a weekly Bible study. God is always faithful and near to us in troubling times as well as good times. I missed meeting in person, but I enjoyed meeting on Zoom when traveling and away from Hopedale. What have I learned? That God is with us during uncertain times that our dependence on God is reassuring because God is faithful and that we are never alone.
God always provides for every need. Be willing to wait for God to act in his time. God has been with us through this time. We were packed, ready for our flight the next day when our children strongly suggested we stay at home. I felt this was God's plan, so we unpacked and stayed at home. We learned to adapt. We learned that the church was a help um, in doing this. To the grandkids, the pandemic was a crazy time, crazy worldwide happening that got everyone's attention. The church is not a building. Without walls, we worship with others who may be miles away or even in other countries across, across the sea. It includes people who have been separated by time, who, who cannot attend here, and now we again, and, and can be together again through Zoom. God has been faithful to us. The pandemic has been a time of reflecting and slowing down. Our church has remained faithful to each other, praying and supporting each other. I have learned of just how deeply HMC cares about each person here and beyond our walls. It was a time of deep struggle and conflicts. I have learned that what we consider normal may not be normal at all. This is a chance to listen to God. Time to seem to slow down, and I was able to reflect on prioritizing what is important in myself, in my life. This is our unprecedented time that we are going through. This is an unprecedented, that word, <laughs> that we are going through. In spite of man's efforts, God still is in charge and has not changed. The pandemic caused fear and concern in the beginning. Many learned to lean on God in prayer like never before. Faith for some was strength, and while others became angry, dealing with the loss of loved ones was also a response. As time went on, it seems most are just weary from dealing with all of it. I sure am. I have learned how much God can use alternate means to keep us connected. I learned how much I value people in the church. I learned that community is so important. Meeting with others in small groups and corporately is, is one pillar of the kingdom of God. And a verse of a song Consecrate me now to thy service, Lord, by your power of grace divine. Let my soul look up with a steadfast hope, and my will be lost in thine. Let's consecrate ourselves as we read the blessing together. We will praise you, O God, to all who will hear. We will tell and sing of your mercy to our children. Your steadfast love is as high as the heavens, and your faithfulness extends to the clouds. Thanks be to God. We'll sing number 419. 419, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And if you're able to, I invite you to stand again.
See, what is that page number? 800 and something. It's in your book. 828. 828 invoices together. Well, since this is a new song, how about if we sing it through once? We'll think, sing verse one, and then we'll go back and start over. There's a wild hope in the wind, a whisper is heard on the breeze. The gale is a shout that is calling us out. There's a wild hope in the wind. And the future is dim, but we want to move into a wild, wild home. Ready, give it a go. There's a wild hope in the wind. A whisper is heard on the breeze. The gale is a shout that is calling us out there's a wild hope in and promise. The future is dim, but we want to live into a wild, wild world. There's a wild hope in the skies, where God is the blue of forever. The purple of night is her heart's beauty right There's a wild hope in the skies. Oh, God, in the skies, come on, our eyes, be our courage and promise. The future is dim, but we want to live into a wild, wild home. There's a wild hope in the earth, her body provides us with nature. The dark underground is more like an abound boys of the wild world. Oh God in the earth, come in every birth, be our courage and promise. The future is dim, but 
what we want to live into a wild, wild home. Oh God of the earth, so made our birth, be our courage and promise. The future is dim, but we want to live into a wild, wild Before we bring our worship to a close, I'd like to uh, uh, invite you to enjoy the snacks that have been pre prepared in the fellowship hall and enjoy that short time of fellowship um, that comes with that. I also invite you to join a Sunday school class. It was interesting to me when I read the lesson that the very first verse of, the, of today's scripture um, for our lesson states, after this, Jesus went to the other side of the sea another crossing of water. Perhaps another crossing of water, an opportunity to be energized and motivated to make meaning together. Let's uh, close our worship service with reading our memory verse, number 624 through 26 together. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Number 6, 24 through 26. Go in peace.